What's up everyone, Lance Hedrick here. And today I'm gonna go over a topic that many have requested over the past couple of years, how to buy coffee. Now a big thing on this channel is pushing more and more people to specialty coffee. What is specialty coffee? It's that coffee that grades above an 80 on a scale of zero to 100 and accounts for about six to 7% of all of the coffee grown in the world. Typically with these higher scores are better at agricultural practices, more sustainable practices, etc. So these are really high quality, much more sustainable coffees that typically the producers are getting paid a little bit more in order to have a more uh, more of a living wage. Now, to get my biases out here right at the beginning, I do work for a big specialty roastery called Onyx Coffee Lab. Now, if you'll notice, I don't have any Onyx on this table. I won't be talking about Onyx, and I also do not have any links below in the caption. Now, in my video today, I will be focusing on how to buy a specialty coffee. Of course, a lot of these tips will translate to non-specialty, but for the most part, I will be relying on specialty. James Hoffman has made a video that I'll link below uh, a couple couple of years back on an, a similar thing, a guide to buying coffees. And he actually touches on how to buy supermarket coffee and commodity coffee and things like that with best practices there. Of course, some of what I say today will be applicable, but not all of it. Everything I'm going to say in this video is are broad generalizations to help you demystify the process of finding the right bean for you. And it's going to be a series of, you know, trial and error, trial and error. But this hopefully will just give you a guideline. When we look at buying coffee, when we're unfamiliar with what coffee coffee we want to buy, the biggest things we need to be looking at. We need to look at origin, we need to look at variety, we need to look at process, we need to look at roast level, roast date, and ideally harvest date. Origin. In the past few years, origin has become less and less of an important thing to look at. Now, the reason I say that before you get you know all up in a tizzy is because of the intensive processing that has accompanied the evolutions of coffee. So nowadays we have all these different types of yeast fermentation processes and all these confusing words that just are, are, are essentially saying how they get the cherry uh, depulped. So how are we getting that seed out? What effect is it having? What is the fermentation going on? Is it is it a low oxygen whoosh whoosh, or is it a, an anaerobic natural, or is it a great co-ferment? Whatever it is, all of these crazy type of processings, they tend to change the bean's characteristics so much that it might not be recognizable to origin. That's not 100% the case, and it's definitely not all of the time, but it does allow, say, uh, some sort of crazy processed Columbia coffee to taste like some sort of Ethiopia coffee. Origin doesn't matter as much today as it did in the past. It still matters, but not as much. Yes, a washed Brazilian versus a washed Ethiopia versus a washed Colombia, most any experienced taster are gonna be able to place those into their proper origins. If you're someone that is looking for a more fruity coffee, and we're speaking strictly of origin right now, looking for a more fruity coffee, floral coffee, something that's more acidic, then I would recommend looking at the Ethiopias or Kenya coffees or something from Africa for the most part. Those tend to, across the board have those characteristics. Now, of course, that's not to say things from El Salvador and Costa Rica and Panama don't have those characteristics. They absolutely do, especially Panama, since the uh, advent of the Geisha, or really the discovery of the Geisha and the pushing of the Geisha, has really become known for all these different characteristics. But if you're looking at just normal priced coffees that are specialty coffees, then I would say if there's an Ethiopia and there's a Costa Rica and there is a Panama on the menu, and you you're someone that wants floral and vibrant and bright, then I would say like go for that Ethiopia. I want to be very clear on this because I don't want to be offending anybody, especially from producing countries. But historically, Brazilian coffees have been known as being chocolatey and peanutty. Coffees from Costa Rica have been known to be um, uh, kind of fruity and chocolatey. Coffees from Kenya have known to be, you know, tart citric and floral, similar with Ethiopia. And then coffees from like Indonesia or Papua New Guinea have, have this kind of understanding of being earthy. These are kind of broad generalizations of what you might expect from these different origins. Kenyas, Burundis, Ugandans, all of these tend to be 
much more fruity. Now, when we're looking at chocolate, then you have Mexico, Nicaragua, you have Colombia, depending on you know where it's from, and you have uh, Sumatra. Looking at origin and trying to decide what you tend to prefer based off of that can be a helpful starting position. Variety. Variety do have you know special characteristics about them, but when you take into account terroir, when you take into account processing, when you take into account roast level, it becomes a lot more difficult to really be able to distinguish between the different varieties, unless it's a really special variety. There are kind of like cheaper varieties, you know, more resilient coffees that are easier to grow. They take less uh, intensive labor, not saying that they're easy, but things like Catorra or Castillo or things like that, Heirloom in Ethiopia, which is kind of just a hodgepodge of multiple different varieties that we're not really sure about. These can be a little bit more difficult to really differentiate on, on the cupping table. But when you have things like a Gesha or a Sidra or SL28, SL34, when you have something like Pacamata, these tend to stand out a little bit more and they should be treated with kind of some caution when you're buying. Now, one that I'm sure you have heard of and have scratched your head wondering why the price is so high is the Gesha varietal. I have one right here, Takesi Gesha. This is from Bolivia. I helped a competitor use this in the World Brewers Cup Championship last year, but this is part of the Gesha variety. Now, what makes it so special it is a difficult to grow and nurture and maintain plant. And so it takes a bit more labor in order to maintain the flowering of it, as well as the cherrying of it, as well well as the processing, picking, and everything of it. It's just a much more expensive plant to cultivate and to process, essentially. It produces a really floral and citric cup. Now, that is kind of what they're known for, is incredibly floral coffees. So giving you something that is a lot more nuanced and a lot more dainty on the palate that is almost tea-like. This is something that really kind of burst on the scene around two decades ago, and it started to really fetch high prices. And this started kind of in Central America, South America, around Panama, you started to really get these really expensive geshes that were overtaking the scene because it was providing an experience that was unmatched essentially at the time. Now, of course, there are people who are able to replicate some of those experiences with other coffees, but the geshe still kind of reigns supreme in its, in, kind of in its recognition of what it's able to do. And so still to this day, if you find a really nice Gesha, it is absolutely worth getting, but it has definitely turned into a marketing ploy. Having a Gesha on your roster is just like, salivating for a lot of coffee companies. They are like, oh, it's a Gesha, I must get it. But the fact of the matter is, is not every Gesha is good. A lot of them are really not good at all. There's a big debate on which one it is historically, but we won't get into that, but I just wanted to you know, clear that up if you're like, oh, he's pronouncing it weird. There's there's a people get with geisha, people with geisha, anyway. You have the cidra variety, which is just Spanish for cider. It's Ecuadorian in base. It's kind of long and pointy, and it has a very intense malic acidity about it, which it can be really, really nice. Then, of course, the other ones that I kind of mentioned were SL28, SL34. These were man-made varieties in Scott Labs, which uh, is now in Kenya. But the these these also give off their own type of intense fruit flavors. Pacamara, these tend to not age super well. So if you're getting a Pacamara, you want to get one that's kind of fresh harvest, which we're going to get into here in a second. But Pacamaras can either be fantastic, and they tend to be really great when they're really fresh, or they can be absolutely awful and just taste like peanuts. The other one I like to point out is Peaberry. Now, Peaberry is not actually a variety. It is essentially a mutation that occurs in coffee cherries. So typically in a coffee cherry, you have two seeds, two beans that are facing each other, okay? And a pea berry, they're kind of morphed into one and it's really, really small. It's supposed to be higher density of sugar. Typically, you really want these pea berries kind of in your coffee because it can spike some of the sweetness or the perceived sweetness. They can happen in any coffee, but typically in Kenya, they happen quite often and they'll sort out the pea berries and sell lots of pea berries. You have a lot of farmers that will put their coffees together, their lots together, and so it's a mixture of different, uh, different varieties. Ruiru, Batian, SL28 and SL34. These are the four main ones you're gonna see out of Kenya. Then in Ethiopia, you have like Ethiopian Landerace, but you also have Heirloom. And because there are so many unknown varieties in Ethiopia, they just kind of say heirloom. You have different you know, variations or mutations of different varieties. So with Bourbon, you have like a pink Bourbon, you have a red Bourbon. With uh, Katswai, you have yellow Katswai, but they all kind of give similar tastes in that cup. So as you're tasting through, make note of the variety and maybe you'll see a trend of what you tend to prefer. Maybe you are obsessed with Gesha and you just, sorry, you're gonna be broke for the rest of your life. Or maybe you really, really enjoy uh, the different Castillos and Catoras from Central America, or maybe you 
you love Pacamara regardless of harvest day. And that's great. These are things that you can keep note of, take note of so that when you're buying coffee, you take a look. What's the variety? Hey, I dig that variety. Let's see if I like it from this roaster, from this origin, etc. I like to see roasters that are transparent and showing what they're paying so that I know that where my money is going is, you know, going towards maybe a more ethical purchasing of the coffee than otherwise could be. I know that there are a lot of people who disagree with that. Uh, in my time in coffee, I found this to be a very helpful practice and it's something that I look for in roasters is transparency. The processing method. There's too many different points and variables in order for us to be overly specific. If you see something with washed, we can expect something that's more clean or tame. Now, what does clean even mean? That just means like the absence of like dirtiness or earthiness or uh, discombobulated flavors essentially. So something that is much more streamlined and more held together with a lot more structure. You see a bag of coffee, it says washed process or it says just washed Ethiopia Yergesheth, something like that. Then you know it's gonna be a little bit more controlled in its presentation. It's gonna have more structure, be more fortified. So when you taste it, it's not going to be like a blast in your face. It's going to be very refined. It'll probably lean more towards florals and you're going to have just a much more, the word I keep coming back to is structured experience. Then of course you have what I call just alternative processing. That's pretty much everything else, different levels of intensity when it comes to these alternative processing. Of course, the most tame would be something like a honey process. Honey process is when they just pulp the coffee. So just you put the cherry through a deep pulper. It's typically like two rolls and they they kind of go through and the pressure pops out that seed and the mucilage that's stuck around it. So I actually have a tattoo here to kind of demonstrate it. You have the skin on the outside and then there's a layer here of mucilage. That mucilage intact, the amount intact kind of dictates that, that level. Now you don't see as much of these black, yellow, red honeys anymore because processing has been kind of overtaken by more advanced methods, but those are something to be aware of. They tend to straddle the line of naturally processed coffees and washed. They tend to be more clean because they aren't fermenting and dry rotting in the sun as much as naturals. That's something that would be kind of from the cleanest and most structured, it would be a, you know, a step down from washed. Then you have just natural, which is the oldest standing way of processing coffee. And this is just, you pick those cherries and you toss them out on concrete or on a dry raised bed and you let it just ferment naturally, but with occasional raking in order for evenness of that uh, fermentation. But for the most part, it's just letting nature do what it does best and, and it just, ferments and rots off of that seed. Because of the way that this is being processed, you tend to have a lot more funky fruity flavors imparted on the seed itself so that through the roasting process, you have more loud and vibrant notes. Now this is going to entail like more perceived acidity. It likely has a bigger body. It's probably gonna be a bit easier to extract. So I would not, you know, push it as hard as say like a washed coffee. And you're overall gonna get more vibrant notes, more in your face. It's gonna be that kind when you grind it, it's like, wow, is someone drinking wine near me or is someone, you know, uh, cutting open a fruit? Very fruity. Natural coffees are known for being like very fruity, very intense, very, very aromatic. Then, of course, we go into the more nuanced processings and that would be things like carbonic maceration which wine drinkers are going to understand that process because it's very common in wine you have anaerobic which is just depleting oxygen from the environment you have lactic processing which is also depleting oxygen but putting it at a temperature so that bacteria which produces lactic acid is kind of the focus of the fermentation and this kind of highlights yogurty and tropical fruits you have all these different kind of processes that are going to push different flavors of course they're not always going to act the same way Lactic processed coffees won't always taste tropical fruity. So you can't look at a bag, say lactic, Lance said tropical fruit, that sounds delicious, buy it, boom. No, these are just generalizations and what should be like, what is kind of the goal of these different types of processings. When you're looking at these bags, take into account the process. If you're someone that wants to be experimental and you want something wild, then if you see something other than natural honey or washed, that might be for you. This bag of coffee, it says we have anaerobic washed. Yes, this will still be kind of a clean structured coffee. They've introduced an anaerobic environment into the processing itself, which allows for a more intensive fermentation than otherwise would be allowed. In standard wash processing, they take those cherries, they pulp them, they put them in a tiled tub that sits outside. So you have varying amounts of fermentation from top to bottom, depending on the exposure to oxygen. But in this, it's an alternative process. So it's gonna have a bit more oomph about it, if that makes any sense. This one right here by Bluebird, this is the T-oxidator process. Now this is one that is 
only observed at Finca Solidad in Ecuador by Pepe. I've got a video of Pepe right here where he talks about that process in depth, but this is also a style of washed process, so it's gonna be a very clean cup, but for the most part, it's gonna be more vibrant than if it were to have just passed through a washed process. So there was actually an interesting paper that came out a few years ago saying that about 60% of all flavor from coffee comes directly from the processing method. If I can find that, I'll link that below in the caption for you to check out. It's a big read, very long, but worth it if you're a nerd like that. These processing methods have a massive effect, even more arguably to this author, more so than terroir, which makes sense whenever you think about the fact that I've, you know, I've hosted cuppings before where I put a lactic processed coffee on the table from Colombia and people assumed blindly that it was an Ethiopia natural, which that shouldn't really be surprising with all the advancements in agriculture, agronomy, etc. in the past few years. Processing has taken kind of a front seat. So whenever you're looking at coffees, make sure you're paying attention to that process method. If you're not adventurous, if you don't want that bang in your face, I would stick with washed. If you're not wanting to potentially have an earthy or muddy or dirty coffee, I know a lot of people don't like that word, but the word is just kind of referring to really blended flavors, things that taste kind of like funky, that don't really have, uh, again, much structure to it, and, and, and taste kind of like honestly like the soil that it came from. Well, sometimes these alternative processing, especially naturals that have been just sitting in the sun, can taste like that. If you're experimental, a lot of times it's worth it because you can get some absolute bangers when they're done well. Roast level. Now, this is a very difficult topic to talk about because around the world, levels of roast are talked about so polarizingly differently. If you go to Starbucks, for instance, and you order their light roast, their blonde roast, what they're offering you is light for them. It's very light. That's like uncharacteristically light for them. But if you go to say a more specialty style shop or like a third wave shop and you order a lightly roasted coffee, it's gonna be 10 times lighter. Like the darkest roasted coffee at a lot of these shops will be lighter than Starbucks blonde roast. So you have a big difference around the world in the vernacular, in the usage, the adaptation of this vernacular. When you're looking at different brands, if you're at a supermarket, if you're at a coffee shop, if you're buying online, that everyone is kind of treating it differently, which is, kind of stinky, but it, you know we don't really have a way right now to kind of universalize what it is. Now, there are some people who argue that talking about density is the best way to universalize the way we discuss roast level. Some people utilize what's called the Agtron, which is a machine that you grind up coffee and you put it on this color reader and it gives you a number that correlates to a, a system where you can kind of understand, oh, this is you know very light, this is kind of dark, etc. So with those, you have no Nordic coffees tend to be over 100, around 110, 120, uh, and so that's like really, really, really light. But you still have specialty roasters that roast in the 60s and 80s. Typically with commodity, you're down to like 30 and 40. Agtron can be a helpful way, but they're very expensive gadgets to buy, and most roasters just don't have them. So they rely on their own perception of, is this light or dark? But of course, that's relegated to their own experience. Just as looking at origin and processing is not the end-all be-all, this also is not going to help Help a ton. If you're at a place and there are three options, one says light, one says medium, one says dark, and you need a bag of coffee, then it can be a good indicator. So if you're someone that enjoys brighter coffees, if you're someone that hopes to have some florality in your coffee or some sort of fruitiness, then light is kind of the way to go. If you're someone that enjoys deeper sweetness, maybe like brown sugar, maybe you don't want as much acidity, but you like to be able to find some if you're really looking, then medium might be good for you. If you're someone that really likes that tobacco, smoky, dark chocolate, you know, kind of caramely coffee, then dark roast might be for you. And all of them are okay. It just depends on your own personal preferences. There are some roasters that will use a spectrum from traditional to modern or something along those lines. They're trying to depart from this light to dark dichotomy, which is very confusing and isn't super helpful. And they're going into this coffee is more on the traditional side, which means it's more so going to replicate a traditional cup of coffee. So that dark chocolate, the bitterness, etc. This cup is more more modern, which means it'll be more vibrant, more fruity, more floral, more intense. There are different ways of discussing these without having to rely on roast level, because in all honesty, roast level doesn't always exactly dictate what that cup experience will be. I've been in the competition scene for years, helping competitors, coaching competitors, and competing myself. And I've had some of the brightest, most acidic coffees you can buy. And more times than not, these coffees are roasted pretty darkly. Sometimes these competition beans will begin to surface some oil 
boils on them after a couple of weeks, meaning they've been roasted pretty dark. But that roast level isn't correlating to the flavor, and it's because a lot of times these more intensely processed coffees just roast a little differently, and you're still getting all that vibrancy, all of that brightness in this darker roasted coffee than you do in lighter roasted other coffees. So if you had, say, a lightly roasted Brazil versus a medium roasted natural Costa Rica, Las Lajas, for instance, that Costa Rica is gonna have a lot more intensity and punchiness about it than that washed Brazil, regardless of which one's lighter or darker. You have to kind of have an, a base understanding of each of these layers in order to make an informed decision on what you're buying. Roast date. For the longest time, people said fresh is best. And when that kind of phrase came out, it was right. And it's because most coffees were darker and with darker coffees, they tend to peak really early and they go downhill quickly. Now, a lot of these will form oils that can go rancid and you'll have a rancid coffee and that's disgusting. But it's not really a helpful guiding light today. So with lighter roasted coffees, a lot of them tend to peak much longer than a few days off of roast. In fact, a lot of them don't taste good at all a few days off of roast. And it's because they have a lot more of that carbon dioxide built up inside the bean itself, and you want it to kind of off gas, and it changes some of its form as it's off gassing. So for instance, a great example is a Pollen's Gold. Now this is a roaster based out of Tokyo, Japan, and they actually recommend on the back of their bag, its peak is 45 to 70 days after roasting. So they're actually recommending you not even open that bag until 45 days post roast. So they put the roast date on there so you have it, but they're saying, but don't touch it for a month and a half. You need to have a little bit of vision whenever you're ordering coffees to know, okay, I need to let this sit for a while. Because if you open before that, it's it's not at its peak yet. There's more deliciousness that can be had if you sit and wait. A similar thing is happening in Nordic countries where roasters are putting on their bag, not necessarily the roast date, but the best after date. So instead of saying this was roasted on April 4th, they'll say this coffee is best after May 4th. Now my rule of thumb is the darker the coffee, the sooner off roast you want to drink it. So with darker coffees, I tend to go around, you know, four to nine days off roast, and that's kind of a sweet spot for those darker coffees. And when I say dark, I'm not talking about like Lavazza dark. I'm not talking about that dark. Um, with that, I don't really have as much experience with in order to really say what the peak window is. I'm talking about when I have a specialty roaster that does a true dark roast, and it's like, quite dark, you know, four to nine, four to 12 days around there is a nice area to drink those coffees. When you go into a more of a medium style roast, something that's like a 60 to 80 to 90 in the Agtron, then I, I like to wait at least like nine days up to around three weeks. I find that to be a really nice window for those more medium style coffees. With really lightly roasted coffees, I don't even open that bag to at least about two weeks off roast, if not three or four, depending on how light it gets. If it's super light, it could take four or more weeks. This is really just kind of a broad suggestion. Your espresso is going to have more body the sooner off roast it is, but it may not be the best tasting. What you'll get are these roasty kind of notes. Well, I say roasty, I don't mean like smoky, but I mean you'll actually taste kind of like a carbony type of taste because it's not yet been released very well. When I'm tasting coffees that are really fresh off roast, a lot of times I can tell that they're really fresh because it has this like tight taste about it where it feels like the flavors have not yet released. If you're ever seeing something on a shelf that's over a month old, be very cautious buying it because only there, there are only a few roasters in the world, uh, when I say a few, I mean probably a few dozen roasters in the world where their coffees will still taste really nice after a month of just normal storage. Of course, you can vac seal, freeze, you can tape the valve on the back and do different things in order to prolong the life of your coffees. But for the most part, if you're at a place and it's four, six, eight weeks off roast, Unless you know the roaster and you know that it ages well, I'd probably steer clear of that. If you're at a grocery store and you see an expired date, I would probably steer clear from those coffees because they're not putting their roast date. You wanna see something that has a roast date on it. Don't hear me saying don't buy a local roaster, definitely do that, but I don't want you to sit there and just marinate over this idea that you have to have it right when it drops out of that roaster because it tastes the best. Let it rest a little bit, give it, give it a try, M maybe make notes daily as it ages and see if there's a specific day that you enjoy it best and keep that in mind as you keep going through your different coffees, the different ones that you're buying. Harvest date. Most countries, most coffee producing countries only have one harvest a year. That means that they are only picking the cherries once a year. And under normal storage circumstances, most coffees 
if it's in a good humidity and a good temperature and is stored properly, will not last longer than four to eight months. Sometimes coffees can last longer just because some coffees are funky like that and they can go a little bit longer, but oftentimes four to eight months is kind of that sweet spot. I only know off the top of my head of one, which is George Howe, but there are some roasters I know that will freeze green coffee and this will elongate the life indefinitely. As long as you keep it frozen, it's essentially gonna elongate the life. It may not be as vibrant and as, as intense as when it was fresh without being frozen, but that's still up to debate among the people doing these studies. For me, I had a 2014 Kenya from him. That was fantastic, uh, when, and I got it in 2021, I believe. I think if you can get a coffee that's fresh harvest, then you're good to go. I know that there are some companies that talk about getting the coffee within a, a two weeks of harvest. That shouldn't really be a selling point because that honestly is just, that's taking a ton of uh, air fuel in order to get this coffee to the roastery in order to serve it. And honestly, a lot of times green does need to rest similar to roasted coffees needing to rest. So I would not necessarily look for something that's fresh as best, like I need two weeks after harvest, it's roasted on my door, done. No. Not that. We just don't want it to get too old and age out. Now, some roasters are good about this and they'll taste coffee over the months. And if they taste that it has aged out, they'll tweak the roast profile to make it a little bit more developed to kind of roast out some of that age. Some other roasters, they'll just take it all together. And other roasters still will just keep giving you the same profile. So you may notice a dip in quality as time goes on. So this is something that is good to know in case you do have that information. I usually won't buy coffees unless I know it's been frozen. That's over a year past harvest. And very rarely do I buy past like nine months past harvest because oftentimes I just get a really aged you know, hollowed kind of musty type of coffee. That's not very good. Two bonuses, navigating taste notes on the bag. So you look at a bag and it says something like intense, whiny, blackberries and black currants. On their roasting table with their water, with their grinder and with their tasting crew, they tasted intense flavors. You have whiny, which is just saying it's gonna have like a fermenty type of taste to it. Blackberries and black currants, that's kind of self-explanatory. It has like the citric malic fusion of these black type of fruits. This coffee, the Kagere from Tim Wendell though, it has the four varieties from Kenya, the SL2834, Rui Ru 11, and Bation. And it also shows what harvest it is. This was the fly crop in December. So this has kind of everything on it that we are talking about. Of course, he doesn't note the roast level, but it's because he always does really lightly roasted coffees. I think sometimes people go a little over over the top. This one has a brulee grapefruit with a lime zest that comes through with an orange blossom that reminds you of dew on the leaves in a summer garden. And with those, I would be a little bit more skeptical, but for the most part with those types of bags, I would look at the thematic notes and just assume, okay, well, they're consistently getting citric. They said lime, they said uh, grapefruit. They're, they're getting tart acidity, tart citric acidity. So likely in this coffee, I will perceive potentially of tart citric acidity. So when you're looking at these bags, you wanna look more at the thematic notes and elements behind the usage of the descriptors and try to get in the mind of the roaster and see what they were kind of going for. I prefer when people use more broad terms like intense or like round that would refer to a tactile experience. You're likely not gonna get exactly what's on the bag. In fact, very, very, very rarely will you get exactly what's on the bag. But I think oftentimes you'll get similar thematic notes as the roaster. They have their own water. They have what they're hoping the coffee tastes like. They have the tasting notes that the importer told them might be in the coffee, or if they were at the farm and they had an experience with a nice fruit and then they went and cupped, it could be plaguing their brain. So there's gonna be a lot of bias on these bags, but I try to look past that and try to surmise some sort of thematic elements that will help me understand what that coffee will taste like. Filter or espresso roast. So for instance, on this Manhattan bag, we have filter roast. What does that mean? Oh, this means it's only for filter. No, that doesn't. Roasters will roast the same coffee in two different ways, which I know that like Tim Wendelbo does and the Coffee Collective does. And so what they're doing is a lighter roasted coffee for filter and a darker for espresso because it's easier to extract a darker roasted coffees on espresso. Not saying that the extraction will be higher necessarily, but you'll hit your extraction that's perfect for that coffee a much easier with a darker roasted coffee. Do you need to get an espresso roast for espresso if there are two different options? Absolutely not. I never get espresso roast ever. 
whatever, I always get filter roast. That just means it's gonna be on the lighter side of what they could also be offering, which would be an espresso roast. Sometimes people offer filter options and espresso options, and they're all different coffees. So what all they're just saying is, these taste best as espresso, these taste best as filter. You can ma mix and match, don't worry about that. Mix and match all day. If you've tried a roaster and had all their filter roasts, but you see an espresso roast that looks really tempting, you look at the origin, you look at the process, you look at the variety, you look at the taste notes, all these different things, well, go ahead and get it and try it. Just know that it'll be a little darker than the typical roasting from that roaster. So you may get a little bitterness or something that uh, maybe you'll need to curb by changing your uh, extraction setup. Okay, I tried my best with how ridiculous the coffee world is. If you have any questions about this, please feel free to hit me up below and I'll do my best to get back to you. Check out the Patreon below. Hit the like and subscribe if you enjoyed this content. I put a lot of work into these. Um, I really appreciate your viewership and your camaraderie in this crazy world of coffee. Thank you. I hope you brew something tasty today and cheers.